Ah, I'm being live stream. Am I am I streaming to the world? Am I streaming to the world already? That's pretty exciting. Yeah, can I can I through. can I shut down? Can I shut down that thing when I'm done? Uh, that's oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah, I think well, you can shut that. Um, Am I am I streaming my streaming to the world? Hey, should I be should I be nervous now, Chris? That I'm no, mate. You have nothing to be nervous about. To the world. All right, no, all right, all right. Task. Thank you, mate. Cool. Right. So, thank you for joining us on Zoom. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. I'm here with my glamorous assistant, Chris, who at the moment is video list because I am because I'm hopeless. Um, <laughs> but. Chris is here for his his sex appeal and for his ability to manage computers and things. <laughs> um, Hi everyone. And you're going to be keeping an eye on chats and questions and yeah. things like that, right, Chris? Yep, I am. Cool, cool. So if you're on Zoom, you can talk in the chat thing, say hello, heckle. You know, em emotional involvement is good. Um, if you're on YouTube, God knows how that works, but Chris will, <laughs> Chris will keep, keep an eye on <laughs> out for that stuff. Um, so, yeah, so we've got we've got quite a few people on, probably quite a few people watching. So we might have lots of questions. So what I, what I will try and do when I go through this is just sort of get an idea of, of the oh, chat's disabled. That's not very useful. Um, I don't actually know how to fix that. Um do you know how to fix that, Chris? Um, just looking. Sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway, chuck it in the chuck it in the questions and answers bit, and Chris will deal with it. Next, uh, Chris can Chris can do the chat. I don't know why. I don't know why no one else can. Um, anyway, sorry. So ch yeah, chat questions. Um, I'm aware that I'm talking to quite a lot of people. So if I so I might not address every single individual question that comes up. I might try and you know, gauge the vibe of the questions and address address things at the appropriate time. Um, so, you know, if I'm if I don't address your specific question, I still love you. I still care deeply about you. I'm just trying to create some educational art that, that works for works for everyone here. Um, so yeah, we can see we can see your question questions. And Chris, you can you can do things with those. I presume you can you can. Say we're going to answer yeah. them. Say we're not. I can, I can, I can type an answer, or we can answer it live. I'll, I'll type answers to what I can, so I don't interrupt you too much. But I'll, I'll interrupt you when I need to. Okay. Right. Cool. So, okay. So this is the first of two sessions that we are going to do. Um, this one is on the basics of getting a trading edge. So this is sort of high level trading stuff. Um, the second one's going to be applied research. We're going to pick an idea and we're going to do some data analysis together. Now this this topic is big, right? Like this this topic is big, and I want to I want to I want to give you an idea of what I think are the most important elements of getting an edge in trading, and I want it to be accessible, and I also want it to be educational, and I also want it to be entertaining. Okay, so I'm sort of thread threading the needle between a lot of stuff. Um, I do talk about this stuff a lot right? i do, do talk about this stuff a lot but every time i talk about it must much to chris's chagrin or however you say that word um oh. i do it a completely different way i have an unquenchable thirst for novelty and chaos um <laughs> so we, we will be we'll be trying trying some new things in this um in this presentation so maybe this will go well maybe this will be an absolute disaster either way thank you for being emotionally involved and let's let's hope for the best Brilliant. I love this it. I'm is, sure it'll be great. <laughs> thanks, man. This, this is the, this is the overview. Right? Um, first, take it seriously. Right? You know, the the trade trading is hard, um, and it's it's hard because it's highly competitive. So you need to come at come at it with a plan. Now, the first part of that plan needs to be to avoid doing really dumb stuff. Right? It's easy to lose money trading. It's hard harder to make money trading but it's also hard to lose a lot of money trading if you don't do really dumb stuff so task number one and the thing that we must sort of tick off first right is just don't do any of this really dumb stuff don't trade too big don't you know trade in and out of positions making brokers really happy don't take sort of really heroic bets and things then we get to the to the meat of the 
of the question. Right? You know, how, how do we actually find edge? And what, you know, what, what is edge? Well, edge is a thing that we can do repeatedly that we're expecting to make money. You know, broadly speaking, we're looking to have all of our buying being too cheap on average, all of our selling being too rich, you know, too expensive on average, and to not take unnecessary risk that we're not rewarded for. And we'll go on a journey through a bunch of trades, through a bunch of examples, explaining how you could do this in a way where you might have a fighting chance of, of getting a trading edge. Um, then we'll talk really briefly about, well, okay, if you found if you found someone who's prepared to trade with you at prices that are, are bad for them, good for you. Right? And you've you know found some uncompetitive niche in which you're you're able to do that. How do you actually do that? Okay. And this really involves doing the very simplest thing informed by the effect or the edge as you understand it. Now, lots of traders come at it going, thinking about trading rules as the primary thing. Um, but, you know, your trading rules are really just informed by whatever market effect or whatever edge you're trying to harness. Okay? Do you want to harness things simple, most direct way possible? Keep it, keep it simple. You know, this is people buying and selling. It's not, it's not rocket science, right? Um, finally, we'll talk about re real brief about portfolio management. And that mostly comes down to taking lots of lots of small bets, right? Trading's a noisy, a noisy business. Each each trade is kind of close to 50-50. Um, so the more you can just take lots of small bets, lots of small different bets, grind it out the better your experience is going to be. Now, finally, and probably the most important thing, you know, this is this is supposed to be, you know, productive as as well as as well as fun. Right? You know, a big part of trading is relaxing and understanding what you can control and what you can't control and being okay with that which you can't control. Yeah. So that's our that's our game plan. Sound good, Chris? Yes, mate. Sounds good. Sorry, I was just replying to some Q and A stuff. Marvelous. Yeah. Right. Now, so this is this is the this is what we're going to address. Right? We are going to address the issue of turning money into more money through buying and selling things in the financial market. Now, in life, there are lots of things you might want to achieve. You might want, you know, you might want love and ice cream and spiritual enlightenment and stuff. In trading, our primary objective is to turn money into more money without taking more risk than we need to. So in a persistent, manageable way. Now, the first and important point is this should terrify you a little bit, right? This is, this is very hard. And the reason it's hard, because it's highly competitive. You know, it's, if, you, if, you could, if you can do this well, you can scale it such that you can make a lot of money. Um, so the problem's hard. You should have a certain amount of anxiety about it. Um, but I do observe people sort of approaching the problem in a very unserious way. You know, they're just sort of drawing pictures on charts or they're playing with machine learning, throwing prices in and stirring them about, or they're just sort of trying to get some kind of edge by looking at lots of economic data and hoping they're smart enough to come up with some kind of thesis or something. Um, but these are really not things you do if you're really serious about making money. Um, you you got you to gotta take it a bit more seriously than that. You know, you wouldn't run a business like that. You wouldn't go, hey, look, I've, I'm going to just consume a whole load of information and hopefully I'll make profitable decisions and I back myself to do it because I'm really smart. No, no one's going to buy that, right? No one's going to lend you money for a business plan that looks like that. So you need to have a more sensible plan based on kind of realistic things that people value and people would pay for. And that mostly comes down to doing useful things that people find valuable that are kind of sucky, right? They're, they're, kind, they're things that you wouldn't necessarily be doing if you weren't getting paid for them. And my friend JP here gives a good example. He says trading is more akin to plumbing. You know, you're doing getting paid to do useful things that other people don't want to do. And that's the 
the first unglamorous truth about all of this stuff that it's not really sort of brain super brain against some stochastic price machine right it's not a it's not a super smart kind of breaking the market cracking the code kind of thing mostly what you're trying to do is help people out help other traders out or help trade towards some kind of market equilibrium doing useful things in uncompetitive places and the uncompetitive thing is important because we're operating in a highly competitive environment and we want to reduce that okay so i'm not going to go through all this but it should be clear and obvious why you're getting paid a market maker knows why he's getting paid and he can explain it in a couple of sentences someone doing etf arbitrage knows how they're getting paid and they can explain it in a couple of sentences sorry let me just get rid of this annoying thing that's that's popping up okay so if a five-year-old can't understand why some trading approach makes money then to be honest you probably don't have a trading strategy okay so if that guy that guy you know he's pretty skeptical looking right if he's going yep i can see how you'd make money from that then maybe maybe you've got a chance right and I've noticed some weird thing no one else has noticed, or I'm smarter than everyone else isn't isn't a business case, right? That's not that's not something that that guy is going to is going to accept and buy. Right? Or as I like to put it, no one ever paid me to eat ice cream in a hot tub, right? There's lots of fun projects I might do, like drawing lines on charts or big machine learning projects or something that are very, very fun and probably quite rewarding and things like that. But stuff that's fun and rewarding for me is unlikely to be stuff that someone else is going to pay me for. Right? No, no one ever paid me to eat ice cream in a hot tub, at, le at least not yet. Maybe if I keep putting this on slides, someone will one day. <laughs> So summary here, right? You don't want to be trying to outsmart, outgun other other traders in a highly competitive zero sum game, because you because you probably can't, right? You just you just probably can't. So you want to want to focus on doing helpful things that people value in as uncompetitive an arena as you as you possibly can. Right? That's where you where you make money. So the the path is straight and narrow. Path is straight and narrow. Focus on doing useful stuff. Focus on minimizing competition. Okay. But the first thing that we need to talk about is if you're doing really dumb stuff, stop. Right? And it's and and lots of people are, right? and I have done, and many of us have done. Um, now I have no idea if this is really true but it's often said that over 90 percent of retail traders lose money okay i don't i don't know that's true but i do know that they often do things that almost guarantee they'll lose money and there's three sort of dominant approaches that i call the the mortal sins and if you're doing them just stop right your, your number one mission is to stop um, and you might think that traders are taking the wrong trades you might think they're losing money because they're buying when they should be selling or they're selling when they should be buying but that turns out to not be the case right you know if they did the opposite of of what they do would they make money well no right they're not incredible negative alpha generating machines if they were it would be easy because they could just switch what they were doing but it's more mundane than that right they're failing because they're either trading too much you know every time you trade you pay a bit of the spread you pay a bit of commission right you make market makers or your broker slightly richer right? or your clearing firm or whatever so this is trading too much is gonna sort of paper cut you right that's if you keep trading all the time you're just gonna die of die of paper cuts the next thing is trading too big. And here you're just going to get wrecked really quickly. You know, the all all trading is highly, highly variable. Right? All, all trading has some amount of tail risk associated with it. Um, and the bigger you do it, the more likely you are to lose a lot of money. And losing a lot of money is really bad because in this game of trading, we need money to make to make more money. 
Okay, so trading too big is how you almost mathematically guarantee that you're going to wreck yourself quickly. Trading too often is how you guarantee you're going to wreck yourself slowly through through paper cuts. Now the other and final thing that people do is just heroic bets. Um, and you might see this as, you know, the guy that keeps trying to short Japanese government bonds, or he keeps trying to short the stock market or call turns in that. Or he's got some trade thesis that involves this happening, then this happening, and that will mean that will happen, and then that will be... And that, you know, that's no way to get to get an edge, right? You know, the, the, the thing, the markets are fish, pretty efficient, and the edges that we see are these sort of blunt, blunt things that that happen come distort the market for a little bit go away okay so highly heroic highly smart 3d chess trading is just a just a kind of a, a good way to make sure that you've got no edge and these things are slowly going to going to kill you okay so my your your first mission i won't spend more time on that your first mission is stop doing that right it's easy to lose money by doing things it's actually quite hard to lose money if you don't do these things um, because the sort of terrifying efficiency of the market means that it's actually quite hard to trade at bad prices so as long as you're not trading too often or trading too big you're not going to die very quickly yeah so number one stop doing that yeah fanny, fanny and freddie being the ultimate smart hedge fro hero trade yeah quite right. so key point on our first bit that was that was bit number one right bit number one don't 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 do dumb shit don't get wrecked um it's easier to lose money than make it but if you avoid doing really dumb stuff then losing losing a lot of money becomes pretty hard okay now now i've sort of you know i've got to cross that one off because i have to right that's the that's the <laughs> the, the number one safety thing that i need to tell you um but now we can get on to the to the good stuff. All right. Now we can get on to the to the to the business of, of what we're trying to talk about here, which is how do we actually get a trading edge? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come at this from a highly unconventional standpoint. Um, I explained before, you know, Chris is always saying, hey, look, you're explaining all the, the same the same stuff all the time. Why do you do it totally different each time? Um, I don't know. Um, I do. I do because I like it. I do because I'm trying trying to find out the most effective way to explain stuff. And here I'm probably going for the most unhinged direction at this material that I've tried to date. But I think it might work. Um, which is to start at a very low level and then and then go high level. So we're going to start with a relative cross exchange mispricing so an asset trading in one place at a different price to another place and we're going to go through low level arbitrage because everything that you know everything that looks like a real trading strategy looks a bit like arbitrage right? then we're going to relax it to be a more risky kind of arbitrage then we're going to relax it to be an even riskier kind of directional trade and we'll we'll sh and the intention here is to show how it gets sort of you know easier in expected return space. You know, it gets easier to make money as you go down the list and be become prepared to take on more risk. Then we're going to talk about edge and the fact that market outcomes are mostly random. Um, how how we can how we can wash all of that out. Then we're going to talk about competition and competition is a really a real hard bit right you know it's easy to find people who are prepared to trade at bad prices for them you know but it's hard to get to trade with those people because everyone else wants to as well you know if we've got robin hood traders throwing money randomly all over the place you know people are prepared to pay large amounts of money simply for the ability to trade with those guys yeah? so it becomes very com very competitive um in order to trade with with people who are prepared to trade at bad prices and that means that we want to be doing things that suck right and this is uh, this we want to be the plumber right you know 
plum plumbing is profitable and one one of the reasons it's profitable because people just don't really want to do it right you know if it was super fun and super attractive people want to do it margins would come down so we find that if we pursue things that suck a bit which mostly means they're risky in some way or they're constrained we can't pull quite enough money out of them then we can potentially compete in an uncompetitive arena yeah, we could compete to do a useful thing in an uncompetitive place. And we'll go through a bunch of examples. And depending on how we get get on with time, we might go through all of this stuff. But if we're if we're, you know, if I'm losing my voice, we might we might skip out some of it. So are you ready ready for an for an unhinged description of trading starting starting with atomic arbitrage? And I then, can't wait to that and, then terms. and then going up from there. Yeah? Awesome. So here, here we go. Here we're we're going super low level to sort of what you probably understand more as what trading looks like. Yeah. So, cool. Consider an asset, yeah? and it could be anything. Um, it's a fungible asset, which means that it's a it's a thing that people accept all over the place. Um, Example might be Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin trades on multiple different exchanges. We can pass it through different venues. I can buy it in one place. I can send it to another place and sell it over there. Um, another example would be a stock. Right? Um, now, if you consider the, the same, same asset trading in two different places, one on exchange A, one on exchange B, and you can see here this is the best bid right so someone is saying that they will be would be prepared to um to buy this thing at 99 dollars someone's saying this is our best ask i must apologize i can't write with my mouse yet it doesn't seem to stop me trying um best ask 101 so if we wanted to buy this asset on this exchange we could do it immediately at 101. If we wanted to sell it, we could do it immediately at 99. Yeah. Now on exchange B, it's trading higher, right? Best bids 103, offers 105 over here. So this might you know, clue you into the fact that we might might have a trade, right? Now we, we, we don't necessarily, for this arbitrage example, need to understand why these prices are different, as long as we're happy that we can move money around frictionlessly. Um, but let's just assume that the reason that this exists is because some big way or buyer came up here and just there's excess demand on exchange B that overwhelmed market makers that usually quote on exchange b and exchange b is just temporarily displaced higher okay. now what do we do well we've got a pretty obvious trade here um, you know we buy this thing at, buy buy the buy this thing for 101 over here on exchange a then we sell it and then we shoot it over to exchange b so whack it over here where we can sell it at 103 uh, realizing a two dollar profit on that trade so just bought it for 104 over here sell that 103 over here realize two dollars profit um and the reason i start here um is because nearly every good trading idea has these features nearly every good trading idea you're buying something that's too cheap either in some absolute sense or relative to something else, selling something that's too rich and accepting or, and managing your risk as best you can. In the real world, this would be risky because we probably can't do that transfer exactly at the same time as everything else. So there would be, probably be some time risk involved, especially given this pricing. Yeah? So every good trading idea looks a bit like arbitrage. It involves you buying below the fair price of a thing, either absolute or relative, selling above, and minimizing accepting risk. This arbitrage trade is also kind of useful, arguably. Right? You know, what happened is some lumpy 
demand came over here in exchange B, causing it to trade too rich. Someone, someone's got to flatten that out, right? You know, so someone's got to donk that back into line with the rest of the market. And if you're the person that takes that arbitrage, you know, it's a slightly tenuous argument, right? But you, arguably, you're doing something useful. Your, your trading exists such to normalize prices and trade in the direction of market efficiency. Um, so. In the arbitrage trade, and the, the way you know people define arbitrage, statistical arbitrage, in all kinds of mad ways, I'm not really interested in what's right. But the way I think about this stuff is if I got into a position knowing how I could get out of it, then that's an arbitrage trade. And assuming that I can do this transfer, right? I can buy it over here, whack it over here, sell it over here. Assuming I can do that in kind of one one blast, right? Um, then I'm getting into this trade knowing exactly how I'm getting out of it, and I'd call I'd call that an arbitrage. Now you might go, well, you know, how often how often does stuff stuff exist like that? Well, not not very often, right? And and the reason that things don't exist like that is because that's an extremely attractive trade. You know, if I as long if I can do this in a single transaction, like I can with some on-chain transactions, right? You know, if it fails, I'm just going to roll back. Then I've effectively made risk-free profit, and if I can keep doing that and churning opportunities like that, that's that's very attractive for me, or at least relatively risk-free, at least at least in the trade itself. Now, it's very rare. <laughs> you know, the very attractive things persist in the market because everyone likes those things and everyone is trying to hit them. So they're enormously competitive. So almost certainly, if we saw if we saw pricing like this, right? if we saw pricing with this discrepancy over here, almost certainly this isn't possible, you know, almost certainly we can't actually buy over here and sell over here instantaneously you know because because if we could someone really fast would have done it already and normalized prices so unless we're the fastest in the market if we see this mispricing we would go ah there's probably not a closed loop arbitrage here but that doesn't mean that there isn't something we might be able to exploit you know? we might be able to exploit something by taking on a bit more risk. For example, we might not be able to do the loopy ARB, but we might do something that looks like a pairs trade. We might go, well, hey, look, this guy over here is relatively cheap. Okay? This guy over here is expensive. So what if I put on a trade where I'm getting into a position expecting I'm going to be able to get out for profit rather than knowing I'm going to be able to get out for profit. I would probably call that a statistical arbitrage, right? Where we go, hey, look, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy over here, you know, buy A where it's cheap. I'm going to sell B where it's rich. Now I'm kind of market neutral and I've bought the I bought the expensive one and I'm sorry, I've sold the expensive one. I bought bought the cheap one. But I have no, I have no clear exit plan now. Right? My my exit plan requires something to happen in the future. I can't put it on and immediately get out of it. Right? Now, what I expect to happen, of course, is I think that this thing that was expensive over here is expensive because some lumpy demand made it expensive, and I'm expecting that just to revert back to fair value over here. So what I'm expecting to happen is for these two these two things to normalize, okay? and then I can get out of the trade. So let's let's run that through and and look at it. Okay? If we assume that Exchange B is priced rich because some lumpy demand, some whales throwing money around there, then we might try we might picture it like this, right? We might say that on Exchange A. The asset was fairly priced. So we've got this sort of fair, fair price line here. Now, on exchange A, we can buy just above 
fair price and we can sell just below fair price. On exchange B, on the other hand, we can buy above fair price and we can sell above fair price as well. So what, what would we do? Well, we'd go, well, we're going to sell the rich one. We're going to buy the cheap one. And then we're expecting the price of the rich one to converge with its fair value. That doesn't mean it's going to, right? It means that if we're right, we expect that to happen. And our expectation there is $2 expected return being short on short on this one. Now we expect the same thing to happen on asset A, right? We expect that to just roughly stay in line with its with its fair price. And we expect to lose money on that guy. Right? So on this guy, nothing, nothing moved, right? Stayed the same price. We needed, we wanted this guy to hedge our exposure. So we've bought 101 and we sold 99 and we've lost the bid ask spread on that on that hedge leg okay so we got this guy converged this guy stays the same even though we saw price convergence we failed to make money on the expected trade that we wanted okay and why was that and that's because trading is expensive right if we're trading we're making four trades here on this thing, right? We need a pretty big discrepancy in order to make money on something like this, even if we're right. Um, and I'll just talk really quickly about why why we traded A. Right? Well, we traded A even though it was fairly priced, but so that we made money regardless of actually what happened in the market. Now, what we know is that anything that happens in the future is mostly unforecastable, right? You know, this guy, it turns out, is up to some shenanigans, right? And that means that what we thought was a fair price of $100 is now not, right? It's now shot down. But because we traded, because we traded market neutral, because we sold B, longed A, our trade expectation is the same either way. Right, you know, this moved down, but we make more money on the short and we lose more money on the long, but our expectation is exactly the same. Now, if it goes up slightly, same thing happens, right? Our trade expectation is exactly the same. So when we put on a trade, a whole bunch of unforecastable things that we can't possibly predict can happen, which will either push the fair line up or push the fair line down. But if we have a hedged position on, none of that affects us too much other than weird and idiosyncratic effect. Yeah? So we want, we want this hedge on, right? Because we like the idea of not having risky trades that might, might lose money or might not lose money. Um, but having that hedge on means that we need a much bigger edge in order to make money because trading is more expensive. So in order to make that trade work, we can't get in where we where we did over here at 103. We need a her trade hurdle here that's bigger than our costs to trade. So it's bigger than our costs to come in and out of two legs of a, of a trade, which means that if we wanted to make a trade like this work, we need to be selling above this line in order to make it happen. What does that mean? Well, it means we're just going to get less opportunities to do that. And in fact, we might get none, right? We might find counterintuitively that stuff that's out by that far is actually the really bad stuff that we were, that we were wrong about. Um, so the lesson so far with this bit is trying to make your risk go away reduces your expected returns and increases the competition for the trade you know if i can put on a market neutral pairs trade that's going to need a bigger edge and therefore be more competitive than if i don't and we're going to see and we're going to see that in option 2 here now option 2 <laughs> to make this trade work is to accept more risk. Right? In that earlier example, we had the hedge leg on where we bought 
asset A, even though it's fairly valued, so that we were market neutral, we'd make money if the market went up or, or went down. We can just drop that leg, right? We can, we can drop that leg. Um, if we do that, our trade that broke even before, was expected to break even before, is now expected to make money. Yeah? It's now expected that we have a $2 expected return on this trade. Um, because because we just we've we've remember before we were going we're we're selling up here and then we're later we're buying over here you know that's a negative negative um spread paying right um so this so by taking on more directional risk we've now got positive expected returns in a trade that means that we it's less competitive to get into because we can get into it earlier Right. So whereas the person who who was hedged had to get into it under above 104, we can potentially afford to get into it earlier. We could eventually afford to get into it here or even, you know, depending on on what our preferences are, even for even for 102 for one dollar expected return. Okay. So what is the trade off? Now, everything has a trader, right? You know, everything has a trade-off. Trading is mostly a game of navigating those trade-offs, deciding what you can manage and, and what you can accept. Now, the trade-off with this is that now our trade returns are variable, right? Now, we're, we're, whereas before in the hedged case, when we had bad luck or unforecastable bad news, it didn't really affect the trade because we were just putting a trade on on convergence, right? Here it does affect the trade, right? Because we're just selling the thing that we thought was expensive, right? If but if we get bad news, that trade long, sorry, that trade short is going to make more money than you expected it to, right? You know, we expected it to make two dollars. That's our expectation. But because we got lucky and some bad news happened, we actually realized more than that. Now, the same works the other way around, right? You know, if some random good news, this guy starts printing money out of that thing, for example, then we're going to reset our expectations higher. That means that our expectation here was convergence. Our expectation here was convergence down here, but actually we're going to just get convergence to our newly restated higher fair value, and we're going to lose money even though it was a good trade. Okay. So that's the trade-off, right? By accepting risk, we end up with less competitive trades and we end up requiring smaller edge in order to make money. But the downside of that is that our trade returns are now variable. Yeah? You know, we can put on good trades, but there's no guarantee that it will work. And you know this from your directional trading, right? You put on a trade, you can be right and lose money. You can be wrong and make money, right? Because random, unforecastable things can happen. How do we manage that? Well, we manage that by taking lots of trades, right? If we're doing high-frequency trading, we're just spinning around doing lots and lots of trades, and that all works itself out really quick. If we're doing more directional trading, we kind of try and diversify a bit more horizontally right we try and take different types of bets at the same time as well as taking lots of different bets and um, so main lessons in this thing good trade isn't one that makes money a bad trade isn't one that loses money good trade is one with positive expectation so the expectation here was the yellow line okay well what we expect to happen if we run the trade lots and lots of times we also saw how if something is really attractive, it's really, really competitive. Right? And we want to avoid competition as much as we can. Right? And one of the easiest or one of the best ways that we have to avoid competition is to do slightly less attractive things. You know, if we can complete a riskless arbitrage, that's going to be insanely competitive. And those things aren't going to come along very often at all. If we can take a bit more risk, and if we can do the pairs trade where we're getting into the position, hoping for convergence in order to come out of it, so it might work and it 
might not do we have no clear idea of when we're getting out we just expect to then these are a bit less competitive okay but reducing risk is still expensive you know hedging out our market risk is still expensive so those trades are still competitive still pretty competitive right you've got to you know you've got to cross a lot of spreads pay a lot of commission being willing to take on more risk in the example that we just looked at taking on the one-sided directional position that opens up even more opportunities right we need less edge in order to get into those positions and they're less competitive um, so this is a thing to thing to bear in mind right trade-offs everywhere now you can't you can't have your cake and eat it you can't go after very high performing trading strategies and expect them not to be ultra competitive which means that you can compete somewhat on the risk spectrum if you're somewhat skilled at taking on risk that other people don't want and managing it then you can compete um, So to make money, you must take on risk in a competitive environment. You can compete by lowering competition, being more prepared to take on and manage risk than others, or by playing in murky places. Yeah. So that means that trading looks a bit like this, right? You know, rather than that sort of arbitrage trade that we started with, really what we're just looking to do is accumulate by buying cheap you know, that accumulates some risk that we want to get rid of at some point. And then we try and sell rich over here. We manage our risk and we want to do it in environments that are as, as less competitive as possible. Right. So for for it, for example, we want to do it in, in you know, if if the opportunities are constrained, right, if you can only pull out six figures a year out of them then they're going to be an awful lot less competitive than if you're looking at treasury futures or es or something like that now the point i want to make here is that in this in this view you know of you know buying cheap accepting risk selling rich minimizing competition um, this looks this looks pretty much like lots of businesses. Um, it looks it looks like a used car yard or something like that. You know, he's also trying to buy cheap by you know buying cars, buying cars off people who want to get rid of them quick, right? Leasing companies, stuff like that. Putting it on a car yard, waiting for people who are prepared to buy something too expensive from him maybe they want that perfect model or maybe they just want the convenience that he sorted it all out and registered it or whatever but his business is the same you know he's just looking to buy too cheap without exactly knowing how he's going to offload the risk and he's looking to wait for a desperate buyer to come along to overpay for it and that's you know that's the unglamorous truth of what what trading edges tend to look like. It's not some sort of super smart mathematical thing. We're just looking for a desperate seller who's going to sell us something too cheap and a desperate buyer who's going to buy something from us too expensive. And we're looking to do that whilst taking on as little risk as possible and in as uncompetitive an arena as we can because everyone else wants to trade with these guys as well yeah. so yeah so anonymous attendee a desperate market actor might be someone who's about to hit a risk limit someone who has to do a rebalance right you know they've got a systematic strategy that has to has to do a balance might be someone with some weird objectives you know trying to trying to achieve something other than um than than getting a good price um so basically someone who's price insensitive, someone who's either forced, they've got some weird objective or, or something like that, and then you're getting paid to, to help them out, essentially. Yeah. And you want, you, want to be, you want to be focusing on stuff like that, not data mining for random rules that, that make money. Um, now, before we get on to some examples of that, right? examples of trades, Let's just talk about the fact that most of the things that we observe are 
random, unforecastable noise. Um, you know, if we we consider a trade that looks like this, right? you know, we had we had an asset that was trading at this price. We, for whatever reason, think it should be trading up here. Um, what we what we expect to happen is we expect the market view to converge with our view. You know, if we're right, but. A whole lot of, I mean, most of what happens in the future is totally unpredictable. <laughs> you know, most, most of what happened is is totally unpredictable, and we 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 can sort of estimate what we expect to happen. But we certainly have no magic, you know, all seeing time machine that lets us lets us understand what's going on. So the actual trade results that we get can be quite different. Now imagine that we're just rewinding and replaying this outcome back lots of times. Sometimes we'll get really extreme trade results. Sometimes we'll get sort of average trade results. And if we were to be, if we were able to kind of do it repeatedly over and over again, we build up something that looks a bit like a histogram here of what our edge looks like. You know, on average, we expect to realize our expected return here, our edge. But our results that we observe are very variable. Okay. Um, and that's that's just a fundamental feature of 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 market and the world. What does it what does it mean? Well it means that one trade is usually meaningless, right? <laughs> you know, it's very hard to extract this expectation from the effect of all these random things that are causing this variance. So when we analyze things, and we'll do we'll do this next week, right? When we, when we analyze things, what we have to try and do is to find groups of things that look about the same and analyze them in in aggregate. Right? So that's important thing about randomness. Right? And maybe the most important thing for everyone. Uh, is that unpredictable randomness, stuff that you have absolutely no control over whatsoever, is a defining feature of financial market returns. So even if you're right, you only make money on average. You must group your trades together for you know similar buckets to have to analyze them in aggregate. So quite possible to be wrong and make money. That's my favorite. Quite possible to be right and lose money. Now, the final bit, final bit of theory before we get into a bunch of trade examples. Um, one thing that becomes really clear when you trade is that markets aren't random. Right? You know, one thing that becomes really, really clear um, when you go, say, from data analysis or stochastic modeling world to order book dynamics, market impact models, things like that, is that markets are highly competitive and adversarial. And if you're not trying to compete, you're probably getting the worst of it. Yeah. So a source of variance in your trading returns isn't just being, it, it, it's also just being wrong about stuff, right? You're, you're more likely to get into trades when you're wrong than when you're right. Why is that? Well, because other people will let you into trades when you're wrong more easily than they'll let you into trades when you're right. And that's, you know, that gets called adverse adverse selection. Yeah. We'll talk, talk about that really, really briefly. Yeah. Now, this thing trading at this price, you know, I mean, all these pictures are the same. Right? This thing trading at the same price, our job as a trader is to go, is it trading at the right price? Is it trading at the wrong price? If it's the right price, we don't have a trade right if it's the wrong price then we have the basis for a for a trade yeah so we need to think about well you know who 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 might be wrong right if if it's the wrong price that requires you know who some either someone to be trading at mad prices or someone to have already traded at mad prices in in what way are we going to be to be wrong about this stuff well, let's do an example here, right? Let's say we think that it's too cheap and it should be trading there. 
And the reason it should be trading there is our old mate Billy Huang over here is just going to run it up. Right? We know for whatever reason he's doing a large amount of completely value insensitive buying. What is that going to do? Well, that's going to drive up the price. Right? It's not it's not rocket science. Right? If you do a shitload of buying, it's going to it's going to drive up the price. Now, if we knew that, let's assume we knew that we would say, well, you know, it's trading down here, but we we strongly suspect old old bill's going to come in and run it up. So we think it should be trading closer to to up here. Yeah. So what what would you do if you thought that was going to happen? Well, you you try and steal the market impact off of this guy. Right? We know that these we know that this buying you know billy's t wapping into this thing say just you know splitting up his orders doing lots of lots of buys into it we know that's going to push the price upwards well what we can do if we know that is we can get in front of it and we can we can steal billy's market impact from him uh, let me get rid of my my doodles we can show how so what we would do is buy cheap down here with the expectation of selling to him up here okay so our effectively our hang on let me draw let me draw a better picture so our buying here is effectively going to steal the market impact from his anticipated buying over here such that when we come up here all of billy's buys are at the elevated price rather than at the lower price so we basically nicked his market impact. Right? We we front we front ran him, and if we're saying that we're doing something useful, which we're going to pretend we're doing, you know, um, we would say that we are providing liquidity to to Billy's TWAP. Right? You know, we bought it in advance, pushed it up. Now we're very generously providing liquidity to to him. Right? Now, here's the important bit: if you saw this coming, or if I saw this come, right? you know. We're smart, but we're not that smart, right? If we saw this coming, other people probably will have seen this coming as well. So what's more likely to happen, you know, in a competitive environment is if we all know that this guy is doing this, others are going to rush to do exactly the same thing that we were doing. Okay, So they rush to do that too cheap. They've effectively stolen the market impact off Billy Huang before we had a chance to, which means that we potentially miss the trade. Now, what this is, is this is a good example of as soon as something is predictable in the market, it starts getting incorporated in the price really quickly, right? because traders like us and other you know, people who are smarter and better at it are racing to take advantage of these opportunities. Yeah. You know, we know we know he's doing that. Everyone knows he's doing that. So the fact that he's going to do that gets incorporated in the price really quickly so that the market impact of his predictable behavior is sort of flattened out. Yeah. Now, from our point of view, this is a blessing and it's also a curse, right? It's a blessing in the sense that other people's trading make it hard for us to trade at bad prices. You know, if we're trading something liquid, it's quite likely to be trading at a re reasonably close to its fair value. But it's a curse in the fact that it makes it hard to make money, right? Trading. <laughs> you know, if, in, in this example, if we'd waited till here, we've we've missed the trade. So what do we want to do? Well, we'd want to look at places where it looks like this, right? You know, maybe this is in some I don't know, dodgy market, or maybe his buying is not that predictable and pretty random or something. So there's only a few people doing this. Uh, you know, no, never think you're the only person doing something. You know, that's that's unrealistic. But you know, if there's only a few people doing, then we still have room to get in here and capture this amount of expected returns here. Uh, you still buy cheapish in this example. So this is the point of this exercise, right? We want our opportunities to, to blah, 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 pardon me, we want our opportunities to be unattractive and uncompetitive. Why do we want them to be unattractive and un uncompetitive? Because 
they we won't be able to we won't be able to get them if we're not right we need a mispricing to persist long enough that we can make money from it when does that happen well that happens when it sucks yeah. so let us summarize once again i'll put my glasses on so that i am brainy again um you're in competition with other traders to make money you need you got to you always trade at other people's prices and right? to make money you need to find someone prepared to trade at a bad price for them good price for 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 you that generally happens when they don't care about price when don't they care about price well they don't care about price when they're forced you know they're they're hitting risk limits they have to liquidate or cut size or something or they're fully systematic they have to trade or when they have you know misaligned incentives they're trading for fun or for yolo or trying to get leverage or tidy up the books before an audit or something like that okay they so find someone to trade with that doesn't care about value you know and then look to help them out unfortunately helping them out is really competitive and there's a there's a huge competitive game to help these people these people out um that means it's hard to make money trading <laughs> you know because everyone else is trying to do it as well but it also means it's hard to make bad buy and sell decisions because you get to trade at prices that are set by the smartest in the business and the quickest in the business so if you're looking for edge you want to trade in places where there's little competition as possible and the best way to do that is to look to do useful things you know help out price insensitive people but do it in places that are somewhat unattractive where you know you can't pull as much money out of it as you like where you have to take on some systemic risk or a bunch of operational effort or some risk that other people would like to avoid if they if they could Now, if we summarize this, and you know, this is this is the summary of this of this presentation here, you want to do useful things that kind of suck. Right? You know, do useful things that people value and would pay for, you know, helping providing liquidity, helping people out buying stuff like that, and do them in uncompetitive places. Right? So we are going to go at the end of this is the end of this section or this session. We're going to go through one, two, three, four, five examples if we have time of this. Well, we're going to look at a strategy. We're going to identify who's the person on the other side of it. You know, who's the person trading at bad prices? Why are we doing something useful? You know, why are we prepared? Why do we expect to get paid by doing the useful thing? And also what sucks about it? How come we get to take the other side of that distortion rather than someone else? Yeah. So we'll go through that. I might, depending on how we get on, I might skip some bits. I might not. Um, Chris, is there, is there any, any questions that you think are worth, are worth mopping up at this point? Um, I, th I think we're okay, James. I think I've, um, I've kind of answered everything on the fly. Oh, good man marvelous yeah if any if if there's any you know big big things let me know i'm kind of watching it out the side of side of my eye i'm also kind of watching myself i can't i can't i can't not look at myself i don't know if it's, no, it's because, of, because because i'm you know an egomaniac yeah. or something i've got i've got a i've got a a, a glowy glowy nose at the moment yes um, well hey um one one important question has just come in while we're having a little break um ratchet wants to know where does james get his shirts oh that is a great question um my my son mostly picks them for for me so he's he picked oh. this one because it had flamingos on it awesome. which i think awesome. it, which i think is about the best criteria for shirt selection you could come up with right nice. <laughs> especially when you're in your 40s i think you have to yeah. have to default to something like that oh yeah i've I'm sort of i've embraced i've embraced dad world right um, yeah. No, I'm go. I go full yeah. dad nowadays. Yeah, perfect. Do it gracefully. Okay, so we're going to start here with something mostly totally unrealistic for most of the people that are watching, but a, but an interesting an interesting thing nevertheless. 
um, and probably one of the easiest things to understand as a as a good trading strategy. Um, and that is that is um, latency arbitrage, high frequency latency arbitrage. Now, imagine you're a high frequency trader trading Russell one thousand futures. Now, I'm in in some ways I'm full of shit here because I've never I've never ever traded Russell one thousand futures, and I've certainly never done high frequency trading on them. So my so my ex my actual example might be, might be absolute nonsense here, but the but the sort of high level. The high level lessons I hope are not are not nonsense here, and we're so we're looking at Russell one thousand futures, right? And we we assume we can buy Russell one thousand futures immediately at this price, and we can sell them immediately at this price. And let's you know if we're market making these things, we're going to have some model that says, hey, what do we think the fair price of of this thing should be? Okay? And we think it's right in the middle there. We think the fair price of it's there we think the you know price we can buy here is price we can sell here so as a as an aggressive high freak as a market maker we're happy here right as a market maker we would be offering up here we would be bidding up here and we'd be happy to flip the ticket on anyone who wants to wants to trade with us if we're doing aggressive high frequency trading we're sort of like the sort of creepy sicko guy that's lurking, wait, waiting for an opportunity, right? And we would look here and go, we've got, we've got no opportunity here. Because if we were to buy, we'd be buying too expensive and we'd lose money. And if we were to sell, we'd be selling too expensive and we'd be losing money. So here we're just, we're just lurking, right? We're just lurking and waiting for a trade to come along that's attractive. Now, at this point, we should talk about how we actually got this line. Well, there's lots of ways that we would, would get that line, but one of the most important inputs into that stuff would be the price of a very liquid instrument that's kind of like it. So you, know, you probably know the S&P e-mini futures, super liquid, trades most of the time, um, more liquid than these Russell 1000 futures we expect so if we saw a move here we would probably build it into our model of where the russell 1000 futures should be trading okay? do we go hey look these things are almost the same right you know if we see if we see a big move over here we should also see a big move over here so imagine a big buyer comes up into the es market and pushes the price up a lot okay then what what would we do you know, this this less liquid thing hasn't moved. Yeah. You know, we can still buy at this price. We can still sell at this price. But we've seen a big buyer come into the E mini market. What would I? What would we expect? Well, we're gonna we're gonna revise our price up here. We're gonna probably go look. Chances are, Russell's gonna follow it. Chances are, you know, this isn't just some completely random thing going on. Probably they know something. Let's revise the fair price of these Russell futures up here. So now, now what can we do? Well, nothing's changed over here except our view of value, which is informed by quickly reacting to this thing over here. So we think the fair value for this thing's up here, but we can actually still buy it here. You know, there's an offer here that no one's pulled yet that we can lift and we can buy cheap down here even though it's, we think it's worth that. And that's what we do, right? You know, we pay some fees and our expected returns is the difference between what we think it's worth here and the fees that we had to pay. Okay? And that's latency arbitrage, right? We're going, hey, look, price discovery happens slowly. Well, no, it doesn't happen slowly. It happens really fast. But it happens bit by bit, right? You know, you mostly happens in super liquid stuff before it happens in less liquid stuff for, for obvious reasons. So there's potentially a trade. If I can react really quickly to moves in liquid stuff, in less liquid stuff, I can find offers here that no one's no one's cancelled because you know they've been sat there and it was reasonable when we were at this price but not reasonable up here and then i can trade with them i can lift that offer and then i'm just reacting quick i'm buying too cheap
Now, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this necessarily, but if I have lots of opportunities that look like that, because that kind of thing happens, or if I'm also market making, then I can you know, just look to be continuously buying cheap, selling rich, and turning over my position a lot so I realize my edge on average. Okay? So it's not easy to do this. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to be the fastest in a highest liquid market like this. But if you are the fastest, you can take nearly all of the obvious good stuff. Okay? And if you're not fastest, you miss out all of the good stuff. So this is a trade, which is really easy to understand, but you probably can't do it. Okay? You're trading against traders who are slower than you, who've left limit orders in place. It's useful in a sense, I guess, because it, you know, it keeps, keeps prices efficient across lots of markets and stuff. Um, what sucks about it? Well, it involves an enormous amount of effort. It involves an enormous amount of capital investment in setting up the ability to do the trade. It's operationally intensive. Um, there's only so much you can scale and get out of that kind of stuff. Now we actually we've I've never done stuff like that in super liquid um markets, but we have done trades like that on chain in crypto, where latency for everyone is extremely large and extremely variable. So you can potentially do you can always kind of look to apply well understood trading techniques to in different places, right? Uh, maybe betting markets or I don't know, Beanie Babies or NFTs or something. Okay, yeah, so that's that's example number one. That was, why did I show you that? Well, I showed you that simply because it's what a really simple trading strategy looks like. Yeah, and all good trading strategies are conceptually really simple. Now, you can't do that, but here's some some things that you would have been able to do. Yeah. Now I'm going to do an FTX example without crying. Um, this is this is an example of front running forced price insensitive trading from a systematic rebalance. So we're going to look at an example of lever the leverage token rebalance on FTX. Yeah. Now imagine this is the Ethereum futures market on FTX, and we're a few minutes before midnight. And someone's about to sell $10 million worth of future contracts, regardless of the price that it's trading in a couple of transactions in a few seconds. Yeah. Now, for, for reference, this is about 10 times bigger than the normal trading volume that will occur in a minute in this product. So what do we, what do we expect to happen? Well, we don't need to un un overthink it. Right? If it isn't fully anticipated and matched with demand on the other side, balancing it out, it's going to cause the price to go down. Okay? Then when this selling stops, what's going to happen? Well, that selling was just completely informationless. Right? So what just a systematic sell had no information associated with it, then we'd expect it to sort of rebound. Now, if we knew this was going to happen, what would we do? Well, we'd get in front of it, right? We'd look to sell this thing ahead of this systematic trade, and then we'd look to cover down here as it completes. And in and in doing that, essentially, just like just like the example we had before, we'll be sort of stealing a bit of market impact, right? You know, we're sort of getting ahead of something that we know is going to happen. We'll be stealing a bit of its market impact, and then down here, holding up the market a little bit, yeah. Which is sort of a useful thing. We're kind of ironing out the impact of a of an event that doesn't have any information associated with it. Now it turns out this isn't wasn't a theoretical thing. You know, this actually happened. Like this is this is that time on Ethereum perpetual chart. Huge huge volume done in that in that place there. And it's because of these guys, right? leverage tokens. So these are a bit like leverage ETFs, where you can buy a thing called ETH bull, and it's a token that's supposed to match three times the returns of Ethereum. Now, you don't really need to know much about that, um, other than it's doing predictable trading based on moves 
in the day. So if Ethereum went up during the day, that token is going to be buying a lot of Ethereum futures. If it went down during the day, that token is going to be selling a lot of Ethereum futures. So it's kind of like a momentum trading strategy, where it's just, you know, if it goes up, it's doing a lot of buying. If it went down during the day, it's doing a lot of selling. And it's doing a lot of it, right? It's doing a lot of it and it's having an impact. So if you know this is happening, you know, imagine that Ethereum has been going down a lot during the day. You know that this fund is going to be doing a big sell at 0002. Oops. Whoopsies. 0002. I've lost my pen. Oh, uh. I don't think it really matters. I've lost my pen. At 002, what would you do? Well, you know, again, none of this is rocket science. You'd get in front of it. You'd front run it. You'd sell ahead of that trade. Then when that big trade came in and distorted price down here, you would supply liquidity to it. You'd be covering your short position. And that's nice for you, right? Because you expect to realize that difference. It's also kind of nice for the for the market and the fund, right? Because your trading here is supporting price, making sure that this thing happens at a you know in a relatively orderly fashion, or at least a slightly more orderly fashion than it would do if you weren't involved. So you can think of it as you know the rebalance a temporary thing, so your market fair value stays about the same. But you know something's going to distort it. So you get in front of it, then you sell to it. And, you know, this is actually what happened. So this is, I can't remember when I did this, but this is an event study from that event. So this is when Ethereum had gone down. We look at the price action around that rebalance at two minutes past midnight. And what do we see? Well, we see exactly what we expect. We see people front running the rebalance. We see the considerable market impact of the event itself. Then we see subsequent reversion of price. So we can get paid by supplying liquidity to this rebalance. And in order to do that, you know, we don't want to do it for fun. In order to do that, we can get ahead of the predictable market move, sell here, buy here. Yeah. And that's, you know, a, use, a useful thing we're doing for the market, arguably, kind of, um, as well as a thing that we expect to lose, to make money from. And that's a pretty good trade if you're a, or sorry, it was a pretty good trade if you were um, a small player. Yeah. Now, your buying is balancing out an imbalance of selling. You're trading in a way that makes the market more orderly. You're doing a useful thing. You're getting less bad execution for the fund in a slightly more orderly market. It also kind of sucks. Like, and one, one of the main reasons it sucks is it's on FTX and that curly cucumber eating guy is about to rob you. So that's you know a very good systematic reason why we saw more of these kind of inefficiencies and things in crypto markets. It also only comes along uh, once a day. And it's not that big, right? So you can't make too much money out of it. Um, but it, these kind of scrappy idiosyncratic things are good trades if you're a smaller trader, because right? they're less competitive. You're doing a useful thing in an uncompetitive place. Useful thing that sucks. Right? So who's trading at bad prices? The fund doing the systematic rebalance. You know, and there's also you can go if you go on Twitter and search for the JP Morgan zero cost collar trade, you'll find examples of other other kind of trades that look like this, where a fund is doing a rebalance that's predictable, you can and and has market impact, and you can potentially trade around that market impact, sort of stealing a bit of the market impact off of it. And why is this useful? You're providing liquidity to the rebalance, reducing its market impact. What sucks about it? Well, it's on FTX, it's in crypto, it's murky, you might get robbed. It only comes along once a day, and the effect's relatively small, except in extreme cases. Now, here's another example outside of the realms of, of crypto, and probably something you can trade, a nice, a nice easy one that the that anyone can get trade. 
uh, Anonymous says, how can you get robbed with the rebat? Oh, I'm just saying anyone with funds on a crypto exchange has to assume there's a non, non-zero chance that they'll get pilfered. Nothing, nothing specific to that trade, just, just, to, just a comment about the market and a reason why that market tends to have more inefficiencies than others. Okay. Now, our last example was a systematic trade. You know, someone distorted price because they were completely insensitive to price and market impact, and every, um, the market knows and can front run it. Yeah? Now, there are noisier opportunities that are created by things like that, but also other effects, such as big traders or a bunch of traders with weird objectives to do something. Maybe they're chasing the latest idea, or maybe they're trying to do some tax harvesting. You know, they're not trying to get the best price. They're doing a certain type of trading for tax reasons. Or, for example, in this case, doing a certain type of trading because they want to manage perception or avoid a difficult conversation. So we're going to talk about turn of the month effects in treasury bonds. Now, imagine you're an esteemed fund manager, right? You're this guy, and you can tell he's an esteemed fund manager because he's wearing a tie. Um, but, you know, he's been a bit of a naughty boy. Um, he has been having a swing at some rather degenerate trades this month. He sat in junk bonds, crappy companies. You know, he's got a short volatility ETF in here. And, you know, Mr. Mr. You know, growth at reasonable prices guy, um, is going to have to disclose his exposures at the end of the month. And he'd rather not have an awkward conversation about why he lost a lot of money in this crap over here. So he might be tempted to do something a little bit naughty. Right? He might be tempted to sell down his trash and buy something more respectable, like treasury bonds, at the end of the month before he has to disclose his position. Now, one fund manager doing this kind of thing probably doesn't make any difference to anything. But if other people like him exist and occasionally tempted to do this kind of thing, it can distort prices. So where the previous inefficiency was an example of a trade created by forced systematic price insensitive trading, this is an example of a bunch of people who are distorting prices because they have other incentives than to trade at good prices. In this case, he wants to avoid, they want to avoid awkward discussions about things. In other cases, they might be trading for tax reasons or, you know, employee stock unlocks or something like that. Now, you might be able to get paid for helping these people out, right? They want to sell down trash and buy high quality bonds at the end of the month. Might you be able to get paid for letting that happen, selling them bonds at the end of the month? Well, yes, it seems, seems that way, right? You know, assume nothing interesting happens and the fair value of treasury bonds stays roughly the same. Now, what we might suggest might happen is at the end of the month, excess demand, lots of buying from people like the suit guy, tidying up exposures at the turn of the month, might cause the price of treasury bonds to distort so that we come into the month end and they're trading too rich versus where they should be. Yeah? Which, because there's nothing associated with that other than some guys doing some naughty shenanigans, we would expect to see that decay, right? revert at the start of the month. So that can be a thesis. What would we do? Well, we'd go and look at the data because, you know, um, we, can, we can come up with any thesis that we like, but if we don't actually see any evidence of it happening, it's not, not much value to us, right? But we do actually see quite a lot of evidence of it happening. You know, look at the start of the month. This, this is calendar day of the month here. This is mean returns for the TLT, Treasury Bond ETF. And what do you see? Well, you see positive returns at the end of the month, you know, consistent with the idea of people bidding them up towards the end of the month. And we see negative returns at the start of the month, consistent with the fact that that excess demand would revert at the start of the month. 
Yeah? Now, have to note that the reason that we're even talking about it is in at least in part because I know this happens, right? So, you know, don't don't think that I created this story and then looked at the data and it was all as neat and tidy as I'm as I'm presenting, as I'm presenting here, as I'm pretending that it is here. But we see something that makes sense, something we can understand as a noisy effect, and something that we've got a fair amount of evidence for in the data, just as we did with the FTX leverage token example. So what would be the trade? Well, again, that, that's not, let's not get clever about it, right? This is, we don't really know when people are going to be doing shenanigans, right? Now, all we know is that on average, probably people exist that are tempted to do this kind of stuff. And sometimes they'll be doing it more, sometimes they could doing it less. Can we tell when they're doing this kind of stuff? Yeah, probably not really, right? So probably what we do is we just look to do the same kind of trade every single some month, right? The, the normal quant trading thing of taking a really blunt effect and just donking it repeatedly and just being okay to it washing out. Yeah? So what what does our trade look like? Well, that's pretty easy, right? You know, at we this is the disconnect, right? We've got excess demand coming in here, causes the treasury bonds we think to become expensive into into month end. So what do we do? Well, we want to sell them, right? We want to be a seller of treasury bonds coming into month end, and we want to cover you know five seven days something like that after at the end of the month once once we've seen our expected reversion. Now because we know this is happening. We don't have to react to it, right? We can we can get in front of it, right? So we so we can do we can do this as well. Right? We can go. Oh, sorry. There we go. So we we'd get in front of it. It's predictable. We think on average it happens every month. It doesn't happen every month, of course, but on on average we think the effect sort of happens. Get in front of it. Sell end of month. Cover. Five five days later, something like that. So this would be the trading strategy. And this is a really good example of what a good trading strategy looks like. It's not complicated. It doesn't have 200 different rules. It doesn't have filters. It doesn't have anything. It's just very simple rules that we can explain in three bullet points or three arrows. Okay. So here's a simulation of what that trade would look like, doing it equal dollar weight on everything all the time. Um, and you can see it's been for something so simple um, and something that's that's market neutral, um, albeit, you know, it's long, it's long at the end of the month, it's short at the, at the start of the month. It's been a fairly consistent moneymaker right? up and up and to the right in a in a reasonable way, which is which is good. Now, there's an absolutely no guarantee that that will carry on working. Right? You know, I have to, have to ask at this point, you, you know, lots of people know about this. I've told lots of people about it. Lots of other people have told lots of people about, about this. I think there's a paper on it. Um, so it's a well-known anomaly that has, has persisted for whatever reason. And we could talk about why you know, why Why the anomaly, why our trading of it would be useful. Well, our trading is useful because it helps people with misaligned objectives do what they want to do. Right? You know, they want to bid up. They want to buy treasury bonds end of the month. We're prepared to sell them to them at the right price. So we're essentially getting paid to front run that, flatten out the impact, provide liquidity to their trading you know you're you're getting paid to push the push the market back to equilibrium which is why i like these pictures right you know you can imagine price comes out there differs from fair value you can imagine we have just a big hammer banging banging the price back down right and you know and we get paid we get paid to hammer the price back down so main main point of contention is why does it suck and the best i've got really is it's noisy you know this thing doesn't happen every month maybe maybe doesn't even make them make money every year right so it's a noisy sort of lumpy high variance tendency that most people wouldn't be allocating money to um, i'm 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 not entirely convinced on my bullshit on that though 
you know then that is a reason that i put because it's persisted right um i i i am surprised this kind of effect has has persisted for as for as long as it has um but i think you know on average if you've got something you understand you know you you understand the effect you've got a lot of consistent evidence of it at some point you just turn your brain off and whack it right you know, as you turn your brain off you whack it you keep whacking it until it stops working for a year and a half or something um, so why why do I think it's a good trade? It kind of sucks in the fact that you know certainly certainly it sits in the in the arena of things that hedge funds would care about more than proprietary trading firms trading their own book. But I think there's still enough people who would be interested in this. And I'm, but I'm not entirely sure why it persists. But I but I can tell a story. So turn of turn of month window dressing effects who's trading at bad prices will fund managers that want to get up to some shenanigans um you know avoid a avoid a difficult conversation our trading is useful because it provides liquidity to them and flattens out the price impact of that noisy trading um what sucks about it well gbs but it's a it's a noisy lumpy high variance thing right? you know if you're if you're a prop firm, you're not putting much capital to something that's like, you know, sharp 0 0.7 or whatever, whatever you expect it to be. But if you're a hedge fund, you probably are. So I don't, I'm not, in, I'm not entirely, entirely convinced of that one. Um, Scott says, how do you know when one of these edges has stopped working? Well, you know, ideally you understand why, right? Ideally you can identify some change in the environment that, would be which would mean that the cause and effect isn't isn't there anymore um an example with that trade is if you i don't know if 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 we get to the point where all of all um all of all mutual fund or whatever kind of exposure reporting has happened continuously all the time off of prime brokers or whatever um then that would obviously take away take away that trade so that would be an easy easy example so i i traded a, a something in um uh our options strategy with entire entire edge was was based on some um of using intraday intraday data for for a volatility estimate that wasn't wasn't widely available um, and i knew as soon as that became widely available that that edge had disappeared um so that's the ideal situation right, where you can point to something structural um, nearly always, or at least, you know, with something like this, I'm almost certain that we won't be able to do that with something like this. I'm almost certain that what's going to happen is it's just going to stop making money. Right? And we're going to look at a chart a year and a half later and go, hey, look, this thing hasn't made any money for a year and a half. Should we, should we give it another half a year? And then we'll probably go, yeah, we'll give it another half a year. Then we'll turn it off. And then a year later, it'll start working again. <laughs> that's, the, that's the usual. That's the usual sort of the usual um, thing. But yeah, it's hard. I mean, you, you've just got to look at the evidence and try and juggle it and make, make, the, best, make the best decision you can. Um, you know, the problem with something like this is that if you've got a strategy that you only expect has sharp 0.5, 0.7, something like that, then you need years worth of observations to know if with any sort of statistical certainty that you've lost your edge. Um, so I think the best thing is just don't depend on any one thing to get you paid, right? You know, don't, don't depend on that one strategy to get you paid, diversify to a lot of ideas and just give everything room to run. You know, if you don't understand why it stopped making money, you know, nothing that you can point to has particularly changed. Just give it give it a bit of rope and see what happens. Yeah, Jacob says it's hard to raise money for seasonal strategies. Yeah, I mean, and that's pro actually, Jacob, that's probably the best answer about what sucks for it. Um, you know, is it's lumpy, right? You know, some something that has exposure for the first half and last half of the month just isn't isn't super super attractive. Um, 
I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take a few of these questions because some of them some of them are interesting. Um, do you ever data mine? Do you ever do data analysis first, check for anomalies, and move forward without an explanation? Yeah, sometimes. Right, not not particularly often, but certainly I'll look for things that I don't really have any idea of why they're there. So, and 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 in order in doing that, I've got this real high level view of why they might be there. And we're sort of getting on to stuff I wanted to talk about next week a bit, um, but I can. I can understand, for example, that certain certain different types of behavior happen at different times of the day, different times of the week, different times of the month. You know, different people are awake doing different things at different times of the of the day. You know, there is a cadence to the work week um, as well as the year. Right? So it's perfectly, I think, reasonable to, to think that if the market is not fully efficient, then we would see some repeated seasonal differences in behavior. Yeah? So I will quite happily look for seasonal effects, for example, without knowing what caused them. Yeah? So you, you might say that's data mining in the sense I have no real thesis around what in particular might be causing them. I'm just looking to see if I can see evidence of them. Or I might have the idea that price can trend due to underreaction or positive feedback effects or something like that. And I might not have any reason for, or, or you know, any kind of idea why in particular that might be the case at that time in that market or something. But I still sort of look for evidence of it. Um, um, what I don't, what I don't ever tend to do is the sort of extreme data mining where you're you're sort of starting at the end of the process. You know, you've got, I think, softwares and things where you go, I'm actually just going to try a bunch of random trading rules, right, and and see if they make money. Um, and, 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 you know, people end up trading stuff that's like, you know, if the cosine of the last of the price seven days ago is above 45, then buy, or, you know, so to totally meaningless crap like that so I, I wouldn't ever do something like that because I, I you know at best if I did that I'd be do, trying to inform what was actually going on um, because you know the the market's just nowhere near that precise right it's a bunch of people reducing risk or taking YOLO bets or doing arbitrage or providing liquidity and there's no real you can never crack what's going on right and it's certainly not precise it's just people having vague tendencies to overpay at certain times or underpay it or sort of sell to cheap at certain times for various reasons, mostly to do with, you know, their own circumstances. Um, so generally I see the market as much noisier than would justify such a, such an approach, right? You know, just, just sort of mining for random stuff that happens to make money. Um, it just seems really unlikely to to be useful. You kind of got to understand why why someone's on the other side, why they prepared to trade at bad prices, why can you expect to get paid, why can you expect to be competitive? You know what what sucks about it. Right now, go go on to this. Um, so those last two examples were all around finding someone or a group of people who were price insensitive. And they were going to trade regardless of value or regardless of price, either because they had to, they were entirely systematic, or, you know, they're being liquidated, or maybe they had, you know, they hit risk limits or something, or because they wanted to, right? They had some other objective. They wanted to hedge, maybe. They wanted to tax harvest. They wanted to avoid an awkward conversation with someone. You know, they're prepared to trade at effectively bad prices for them, good prices for you. You could get paid to help them out. Now, don't think the world is so clean that you can identify these things with any precision. Right? Often we can't predict what people are going to do. Often all we really observe is a distortion after the fact. We observe, hey, look, this thing looks like it's got too expensive. 
then maybe we might be able to understand why. So things like equity pairs trading or equity statistical arbitrage or trades, relative value trades and derivatives are often doing this. They're often just going, hey, look, I've identified an opportunity where something has got distorted. Can I get paid to push it back? And this is, this is mostly what statistical arbitrage is called. And I'll go through this really, really quick. Now, these are kind of trades that I was doing probably over a decade ago right? Um, in, in interest rate futures. And this is, this is a nice, I wanted to do pairs, equity pairs trading, but this is sort of a cleaner, a cleaner example. Um, imagine you're trading short-term interest rate futures. Right? In, the, in this case, the, the futures are priced up, say, 100 minus the, minus the yield. And you might plot the price of the futures contracts for different expiring months like this. And you might fit a curve to, to that. And you go, hey, look, this is, this is roughly how the market is pricing interest rate expectations, plus all the risk premium and supply and demand stuff associated with market prices for these for interest rates for whatever this thing is. Okay? So you, you know, you think it all looks like this. You've got no obvious mispricing there. Right? So you go and have a wee, make a tea, something like that. When you come back, it looks like, looks like this. Yeah. Well, what happened? Well, this guy, this guy's popped up. Right? This, guy, this guy's popped up. And, it, and it, you know, it looks like maybe this guy's mispriced. Maybe, maybe what actually happened is there was just random super lumpy demand for this thing that came in, you know, it wasn't someone smart. It pushed, pushed the price of that expiry up. Yeah. Maybe something important is happening in February and this is pricing it in properly. Maybe someone knows something about the curve generally and is expressing it simply in, in this thing. But the point of professional traders generally is to try and work the probabilities on which one of these things is more likely to, to happen. And if we think it's the first one, right, if we can see no real evidence of any kind of seasonal economic reason why this would be the case, then we probably think this first one's the case. And then we'd put on a trade that looks like this. Right? We'd go, hey, look, we are paid for keeping the market orderly, supplying liquidity to people that need it. And, you know, if this was caused by someone running this thing up, then let's sell it here, let's buy it here. And we're getting paid once again to be the hammer, right? We're being the big hammer, hammer of market, of enough market efficiency that comes along and flattens out the curve and donks it down. Now, that's the best case, right? Yeah, that's the best case. The worst case is we were wrong, right? You know, if this was if this was actually pricing in this expiry correctly, we put on the the fly here, and it wouldn't it wouldn't make any money, right? Because if we if we buy three fairly valued things, then we're going to lose trading costs. Right? So not not a particularly good trade. If we're wrong about if we're very wrong, right? you know, this person knew something, right? This person knew something. We were wrong. We've got effectively the wrong the wrong trade on well then this is where we sort of start to get a bit more wrecked yeah in the trade so the trade the trade there is interesting because it's potentially more like what you do most of the time i guess if you're trading statistical arbitrage where your idea is really there are relationships between similar things occasionally lumpy buying or selling comes in and it dislocates or distorts the price of one of one or more of those things you get paid on average for pushing things back into place when that happens and you know most of sort of mid frequency trading statistical arbitrage type strategies are basically doing that um, they're basically liquidity provision once the usual liquidity providers are a bit wrecked 
um, you know, sort of price has moved far enough to actually sort of temporarily distort prices, and I'm getting paid to be the hammer, hammering things down. So the person who's on the wrong side of this is lumpy, lumpy aggressive traders that just sort of, you know, just want to YOLO something somewhere. Um, they overwhelm the normal liquidity providers, temporarily dislocate price. Um, why is your trading useful? Well, it helps trade back towards market equilibrium, right? You're, you're effectively the liquidity provider of last resort, flattening things out. Um, what sucks about it? Well, you can only eat what you're fed in this kind of thing. Right? You know, if if the market's totally orderly, if everyone liquidity providers are eating all the flow that turns up, keeping prices nice and stable, nice and nice and orderly, then you're not going to get much of a much of a bite. Um, doing this kind of thing, you're also likely to be on the wrong side of informed trading. Um, you know, you're often likely to be selling something when someone who knows something's buying something. So all these things look sort of similar, right? And that's for good reason, because this stuff is not rocket science. Um, you know, people, people buy stuff and they make it too expensive. Or people sell stuff and they make it too cheap. And roughly speaking, you can get paid for pushing things back towards equilibrium and taking on some risk in, in order to do it. You know, it's not a, not a highly, at least conceptually, not a highly technical discipline. Right? It's more more straightforward than that. All right. Before I go into risk premium harvesting, is there anything is there anything important I've missed, Chris? Um, no, I think all good, mate. Um, We're all good. Just, there's, there's a few. I'm just going to work through these questions, and I'll, I'll bring. I'll give you a shout if there's anything I can't can't answer. Cool. Okay, final final example, and probably the most, you know, the most practical out of everything that I've that I've spoken about. The things that you can do easily are the treasury bonds trade that we talked about at the turn of the month, and this, which you're probably almost certainly doing already, um, which is the fact that if we look at long run stock and government bond indexes across the world. We see them significantly outperform the returns of safe assets nearly everywhere. Okay? So you can see that stock indexes outperformed nearly everywhere where it's easy to get data. And why, why is that? Well, it's because people don't like, people prefer certain things over risky things. Right? So if you are prepared to take on risk, you can expect greater expected returns for doing so because there's enough people that are keen to keen to avoid risk. So for example, which of these two games would you most like to play? Like a game where this is a funny game, right? A game where I just give you a hundred dollars. Or a game where we flip a coin and if it's heads, you have to give me a hundred dollars, but if it's tails, I give you three times as much. I give you three hundred dollars. Now if you're like if you're like most people, I you know, if you're like most non-FX traders, then you would you would pick the rational choice, right? You would say, hey, look, I would prefer the sure thing here than this thing here because I know that these two have the same expected value. I could do that calculation here, right? You know, the expected value of game one is obviously hundred dollars because I just give you a hundred dollars. The effective value of game two, you know, there's a fifty percent chance that you give me bunch of money there's a 50 percent chance that i give you a lot of money but the expected value if we kept playing that game repeatedly is you'd make a hundred dollars each time on average now unless unless you really needed three hundred dollars there's no reason why you'd pay this game now this game has the same value to you as this game but this game has more risk um, so there is no reason as a rational person looking to maximize expected return from playing this game that you would take on the riskier game for the same amount of expected return. However, if the terms of game two were slightly more attractive, you might take it. So if I make, if I make game two cheaper right, for you to play, if I said, hey, look, if you 
if you got a if we got a heads, right? Then you only need to give me seventy-five dollars, and I'm still going to give you three hundred. Then would you would you play it? Would you take the riskier game? Well, you you might do, right? You might do at this point because you go, hey, well, look, my expected returns are higher down here. It's riskier, but it's also higher. Um, am I prepared to pay it? Play it? Well, maybe. Depends, depends how I feel about risk and things. Now, we can extend this example to something that looks more like a financial asset. Right? Which of these assets would you rather buy for $10? Okay? One that definitely pays you back 11 k right? in a year's time. So you buy this for $10, they go and invest your money, you definitely get 11 k back at the end of the year. Or this guy over here, where we expect to get 11K, but it, our money might double or it might have in value. Well, well no one's going to pick this one. <laughs> the, the expected returns of these two, and this might be, say, you can imagine this is a T-bill, right? This one might be a stock down here. No one's going to take the extra risk for the same expectation. Well, no one, no one's going to do it. So, what, what are you going, what are you going to find? Right? Well, if these assets traded on exchange, you'll find that very few people are going to buy this asset. Right? No, no one's going to be interested in something with the same expected returns as something completely riskless. Right? But you're going to find lots of people are going to sell it, right? Because they're going to go. There's no reason why. You know, I, I could, I can, I'm going to take the other side of this. Right? I'm going to. I'm going to sell this risk. So if you have lots of sellers and not many buyers, what happens? Well, markets are supply demand balancing machines, right? They're going to they're going to price it to the point where we've got an equal number of roughly buyers and sellers, which is going to be lower, right? So now we're going to find that this asset that looked a bit like a stock is effectively cheaper. Going to be trading cheaper versus its expected returns. So we're going to find that the returns of this asset, the risky asset, are now higher. Why? Because the market priced the risky asset lower than it would have been if it had been risk-free. Okay? And this is why stocks make money over the long run. Right? You know, the first, for the first um, asset looks a bit like T-bills. The second looks a bit like a stock investment, right? It, you know, you're investing in an index of companies that make money, share their profits with you through distributions. Um, now, if that's expected to yield the same as a T bill or something like that, no one's gonna, no one's gonna buy them. Right? You're gonna have an excess of supply versus demand, and the asset is going to trade down to the price where its yield is more attractive. And that's why we see positive expected returns for things like stock indexes, government bond indexes, things like that over the long run. Okay, Because the market prices in sort of discount into the price such that their expected returns are higher, which is a very long winded way of saying that stocks and government bonds and other risky assets make money over time. Yeah? And that, that edge is available to you in a really, really simple way if you're prepared to take on that risk. And that simple way is just getting long, right? Getting, getting long stock indexes, getting long government bond indexes, maybe diversifying with alternatives like commodities or trend following or something if you, if you want to. Um, but really, this is only a game that you can only screw up, right? Like you just need to do it and, and rebalance. So that was five examples, right? Five examples of, of, of trades that are built around an edge. Now, the important thing is identifying the edge, right? Who is prepared to distort prices? You know, who is prepared to, pay, to trade at bad prices? It's going to be someone who's price insensitive, right? Someone who's forced or someone who's trying to do something other then get the best price. Maybe they're trying to hedge. Maybe they're trying to harvest tax stuff. Maybe they're 
you know, trying to look good in front of someone, something like that. Now, then we go, well, how do we, how do we get to be the people trading at these prices, getting paid to push them back or supply liquidity to them or something like that? And that's a really important question. Right? We only get to do that when something about it sucks. Right? So with everything that we want to trade, we don't want to believe that we're super smart. Right? We're getting paid because we're brainy. Or we're the only person that found this or something like that. And we need to understand other people know about this, right? You know, we're getting paid because we're willing to accept something that someone else isn't isn't willing to accept, right? Maybe it's more work, or maybe it's just work for a really small dollar potential dollar value of profit, or maybe it's risk that other people are competitive enough that they can avoid. But you want, but you want to know what those things are. Now, that stuff doesn't have much to do with trading rules, right? That's just an inefficiency or a distortion in the market. Once we've identified this distortion in the market, then we go, well, how do we, how do we actually trade it? Yeah? How do we actually trade? And the important thing here is that the rules you use, your trading rules, are not the effect, right? The effect is a people person thing, a right? people thing, right? P uh, the effect is buying and selling and market distortions and fear and greed and pussies and idiots and, you know, all, all that stuff. Right? The rules that you use to then harness that effect are your trading rules. Right? Those, are, those, those are just the simple way that you plan to extract money from the inefficiency. But the important thing is the inefficiency, and the inefficiency informs all of your trading rules. Um, so your trading rules should be as simple and direct as possible. You know, if, tra if your trading rules re requires very specific rules, you know, if you set some parameters to something and it works, and you set some parameters to something and it doesn't, that's just indicating that you don't really have an effect that you can harness. Okay? So you need to keep things simple keep things direct, understand that one trade result is totally meaningless, right? edge accrues over time, trade small, take lots of different bets. Yeah? So a real good trading strategy doesn't look like the kind of thing that I saw the other day when I went on TradingView. Yeah? Some guy on TradingView said, hey, put some simple technical strategy together. And there was a combination of like 12 different TA indicators and filters and things like that. That's not, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about here. You know, a sensible trading strategy looks like that treasury bond thing where you're just buying five days, five days before the end of the month, selling on the end of the month and covering five days later. Yeah? You know, that, that is a simple trading strategy exploiting a simple blunt effect. Don't want complicated shit. Yeah? Everything, everything's too noisy to, to justify that. So this is, you know, I often, I often kind of um, quote phrases that are said to me by this guy, um, Brett, who's a guy that I used to work with, who has a lot of good phrases. Some of them are even things that he actually said. I think this one actually is a thing that he actually said, but I've invented so many things that he's said in my, in my life that I forget which one's which. Um, but this one stays with me. Uh, he goes, hey, look, we want edges that are so big, we can screw up the trading implementation and still make money. And why do we want that? Well, because we know we're going to screw up the trading implementation. Uh, so precision is your enemy. You want stuff big, blunt, and obvious. Uh, you want stuff that survives any dumb way of sort of trading it in roughly the right way. Uh, So I think that's the end of my sermon for today. Summary for today, take it seriously. You need a plan. Don't do stupid stuff. Right? Easy to lose money doing stupid stuff. Second, find edge by doing useful things in uncompetitive places. That involves buying below what it's worth, what stuff is worth on average, selling above what stuff's worth on average, and not taking on unnecessary risk. But understand that minimizing risk squishes your expected returns and understand that you need to play in 
uncompetitive places. And that almost certainly is going to involve taking on a bit more risk than other people are prepared to take on. Um, so you need to understand that, work out with any trading opportunity, what is it that sucks about this thing? So you're, if you want a mantra, you want to be doing useful things that suck. Yeah. That's where, where you want to be focusing on. Next, once you understand an effect, you understand how you might get paid to harness it. Harness it in the simplest, most direct possible way possible. Don't mess around. Don't be too cute. There's no, no value whatsoever in being too cute. There's no precision in a bunch of guys randomly buying and selling. Then diversify. We haven't really had time to talk about this in much detail, um, but if you're trading sort of noisy stuff, you know, noisy, relatively high variant stuff, one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to trade quite a lot of it. Now, you know, that's practically a good idea because the more stuff you trade, the more likely it is that you're not trading without an edge, that you're trading yeah, not trading without that. You know, the more stuff you're trading, the more likely it is that at least some of it is still working. Yeah. It also useful in the fact in the kind of normal sort of mathematical way that you understand that the more 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 you diversify, the the lower the variance of your of your portfolio. But you know, practically, just trade as much stuff as you can manage, yeah. and you'll find that the you can manage bit is the constraint there. You know, everything takes longer than 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 you'd like it to. So, so you know, be kind on yourself. Now, finally, last point, um, don't get hung up on market variance, right? You know, remember that, remember those pictures where we said, hey, look, is this the right price? Is this the right price? If it is, we expect sort of convergence here. But we've also got these sort of, you know, bombs of randomness hitting all of the time that are just pushing this around, right? That means that our short-term results are just absolutely swamped with randomness. So, you know, don't sweat over market movements that you could never have predicted. You've got to chill out, work out, you know, do your analysis with a clear head ahead of time and just allow the variance to wash over you over time and relax and enjoy yourself and feel confident that there will always be new edges and opportunities. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I've, I've never, never been out of ideas. So that's my summary of the sort of high level kind of theory and examples, I guess, of edge extraction. Um, next week we'll be on here 12 hours ahead of this, I think, Chris. Yeah, 12 hours ahead of this. And we're going to do some research together. So I'm going to get research notebooks and data up and we'll actually do uh, go through the research process. Like, do, do research in real time with you. Awesome. Um, James, do you want to do you want to go through these questions um, live, or should, would would you rather me just sort of go through and, and continue to answer them? Uh, how many How many have you got? Oh, they were just the ones that are up uh, there. The sort of yeah, there's there's a half. There's there's oh, there's only probably two or three that we need to answer. I think. Okay, so one the first one is one about so what we talked about um, about risk premium, and we talked about hey, look, if we're expecting stocks to yield a certain amount um, you respect to, to yield a certain amount and some risk-free instrument is yielding the same amount then we're going to struggle to find buyers for stocks uh, you know people will go hey look i'm gonna i'm not i'm not gonna buy that right i can get same level of expected returns from a risk-free instrument and this Question answer says, hey, but look, you know, the SP yield is roughly the same as treasuries at the moment. Yeah. And that and that's that's true, I think, if you did it coincidentally. Um, but remember, remember that stocks are forward-looking, right? The the you know, stock problem markets are forward-looking. The, the the important point of comparison is what do I think these things are going to yield over some forward horizon versus what do I think some risk-free short-term rate is going to be over similar horizon okay? on, a, on a rolling basis. So where these effects come in is that we can't say very 
confident things at all about the future, right? You know, who who knows what the effective yield of the S and P is going to be over the future ten year horizon? And we're just we're just not very good at that. So these things are all much more imprecise comparisons than you might you might think. They're not just compare comparing two co coincident numbers to each other. So Danny says. V by VT, by VT and chill. Yeah, if I wanted to summarize this into into what what, what is this is not financial advice, um, but what should most people be doing? They should probably be doing something like that, right? They should probably just be getting long risk assets, diversify with other things such as you know long duration government bonds or something like that, and then just hit the beach and enjoy themselves. Now, now, so some of us are wired weirdly, and and we want to trade for reasons that have to do with making money as well as other more spiritual <laughs> spiritual reasons. Um, but yeah, for most people, just yeah, get along some risk assets, rebalance, re rebalance twice a year, and chill out. Right? For a hypothetical time series analysis, how can you avoid overfitting when trying to figure out the best look back forward period? Um, I get. I mean, I get. You you can't you can't to an extent, but certainly like everything you do wants to make sense, right? Like if you're if you're looking back over a certain amount of data for some reason, it's because you think that there's some level of stationarity or similarness in that or or time series effect in that window right so you just want to go and look in the data and try and justify why it makes sense right? so you know do i is do, am, I, am i using this amount of data based on the, my understanding of the actual cause and effect that i'm trying to trying to harness um, you also want to just make sure that nothing you're doing is dependent on any specific answers right you know if you if you have some fit that works when you're fitting to 61 days of data but not 63 days of data then you know you want to be want to be very very skeptical about that but yeah i mean best thing to do to not overfit is to do things that aren't over dumb and over fitty things uh, but the second way best way is just make sure you're always walking stuff forward if you're doing a fit right just make sure you're making you you're happy that doing a fit is a reasonable thing to do right make sure that you're not just doing fits for the sake for the sake of it and by mm. that i mean that you know if i'm walking forward doing a fit and it, then I'm testing it out in the next forward period. Then I'm walking forward doing a fit. Then I'm testing it out in the next forward period. Can I prove to myself there's some validity to that? Um, can I can I prove to myself that is actually adding value and there is a reasonable time varying persistence to that stuff? And probably a bigger question than we have time for. But if you if you like, yeah. chuck me shoot me a thing on on Twitter and I'll I'll get round to writing something about it if you like um so you're answering a back test question so it applies to my time yeah cool uh what's the realistic returns for such strategy now oh, that's really hard to hard to say right you know for, for investing type things um you know you're probably talking around sharp ratios of point five point seven you know that sort of range where your say your annualized volatility is just a you know a, around twice your expected returns maybe a bit less you know that's a conservative effort of what you could manage doing sort of low frequency investing like things um if you're prepared to play in murkier places taking on more existential risk and things like that then and you're prepared to be sort of dedicated with it then applying effectively professional trading strategies at very small scale in murky places can be a a very sort of high risk return thing um but also a lot of work so you know it's, it's highly dependent on the amount of effort you put in and as well as the the amount of i guess existential or credit risk you're prepared prepared to take trade-offs everywhere 
yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no free money anyway. Um, cool. Yeah, I think I've, have I mostly done it? Uh, yes, yeah. I believe you have. Um, yeah. Ratchet asked, is there anything to prep for the next session, brush up on any tool sets or anything like that? I'm not sure yet because I've done zero preparation for the next session. <laughs> so I will, I will, I will go and I will probably. I think I'm going to do football practice today. So I'm taking my son cool. out and we're going to do, we're, we're taking all of the balls that we own out to the pitch and practicing, practicing our shooting. So I'll do that. I'll yes. probably log off for the rest of the day. And then I'll start thinking about what we're going to do next week. Yeah. Fantastic. And I'll let, I'll let you know if there's any preparation. Um, I, I'm going to be more about the sort of mental game of research than the, the tool. Because obviously I can't teach you like, coding or anything like that in an hour or however long however long we've been here uh, but what i can what i want to do is go look what is going through my head when i am looking at this you know how am i formulating a hypothesis how am i thinking about it what am i doing like what am i uncertain about what am i a bit more confident about so just sort of the men the mental game of research is what i what i want to go through awesome mate. That sounds great. Sweet, and I'll let you. I'll let you know. So, thank you for thank you for being with us. I I, th I think I took a lot longer than I planned, didn't I? I do, I do do that. It's because that's I okay. because oh, I change everything old. all the time, and I don't really prepare, Chris. That's that's what it is. You need you need no, to get was, some better better staff around here. Marvelous. Great. Well, thank you very much. I will see you next week if you want to come and and play if not hopefully you'll watch the replay if i haven't bored you to tears yeah. awesome I'll thank you james